The School at the Chalet, Chapter 24, Consequences. It was the day after Grizel's grand escapade, which had so nearly ended in terrible disaster, and it was a day which none of the girls ever forgot. The sun shone gloriously the whole time, as if to make up for its behavior of yesterday. The gypsy band had come up to the lake again, and was making music outside the Crown Prince Carl, but all this meant nothing to the school for Grizel was ill with bronchitis, and Joey Bettany had never come out of the sleep into which she had fallen after they had laid her in the Herr Munch's car, which had been waiting for them at the foot of the mountain. Herr Marini had gone hot foot to Innsbruck to fetch doctor, and he had said that the awful nerve strain through which the imaginative, highly strung child had gone might result in brain fever. That could only be decided when she came out of the heavy stupor to which she lay, and which might last for two or three days yet. Grizel's case was far simpler. It was a straightforward attack of bronchitis, the natural result of having been for hours clinging in the mist. It was, of course, made worse by the fact that she had gone all to pieces when she found herself in her own bed, but with careful nursing, and they could be sure of that she would soon be all right again. Joey's case was far more doubtful. Then he left them, promising to return the next day. Frau Mensch had appeared in the morning and carried off Amy and Margia, and Frau Rincini had sent Bet over to fetch the little Mercers. She had offered to have Simone as well, but Simone had begged to stay, and Juliet had offered to look after her, so they had given the child her way. Midday had brought Frau Marini with an offer to nurse Grizel, and Madge herself had never left Joey for a minute until the doctor had arrived, and with one glance at her white face had sternly ordered her out. "'It will make things worse if you are ill,' he told her. "'Go and have some food, and then a little walk. Tonight you must sleep, while the young lady, ah, Fräulein Minard, watches. Nothing will occur for some hours yet.' Then the anguish in her eyes touched his compassion, and he had added, She looks better, seems more natural. Now go and rest. Madge did as she was told, as far as going out was concerned. She had gone to the pine wood and was wandering up and down when Simone had caught sight of her, and breaking away from Juliet, had rushed across the meadow and caught her arm with hot little hands. Now, as she saw the child's face, all puffed and swollen with crying, Miss Bettany felt suddenly that she had been neglecting her duty. She slipped an arm around Simone, who promptly began to sniff again. The doctor says nothing will happen for some hours yet, but he thinks she looks more natural. Don't cry, Simone. Simone had a valiant attempt to cheek her tears and succeeded. I do love Joey so much, she said in a quivering voice. Oh, madame, if there is one little thing I can do, you will tell me. Yes, said Madge. I can tell you of one little thing now. You can stop crying and try to be brave. Tomorrow there will be school as usual. Joey is far above the schoolrooms, and I know you will all be quiet. We shall break up on Tuesday or Wednesday instead of a week later as I had intended. I want you to be very brave and work as steadily as you can for two days. If the others see you and Juliet, she smiled at the other girl, who had now come up with them, trying to go on as usual, they will try too, and that will make things easier for us all. I will try, Simone said soberly. I will very, very try. I will do my level best, Juliet promised, and I will look after Simone, madame. Thank you, both of you, said Madge. Now I must go back as I may be needed. She turned and went back to the chalet, feeling fresher for her little rest and more able to cope with things. She found Joey laying as she had left her, with the doctor sitting by her side. He looked up at the girl as she entered, but made no other movement. Madge bent over the bed, looking at the dear, funny little face, with a world of love in her eyes. Was it her imagination, or did Joey really look more like herself? She glanced up at the doctor inquiringly, and he nodded his head. 
Yes, it is really so. I begin to have hopes of her. We cannot yet say definitely, but the pulse is stronger, and the temperature has risen no further. Now go and change your clothes, and have a bath and wash your hair. Madge quite literally gaped at him, wondering if she had heard right. Yes, I mean that, he said, nodding his head again. Go to the hotel with this note, and have your hair shampooed. There is more than time for it, and it is better tonic than any uh, I can mix for you in my dispensary. Sheer astonishment rendered her dumb and obedient. She had thought, as she mounted the stairs, that she could only leave the bedroom again when she knew that Joey was safe. Now clutching his note, she made her way to the Crown's Pence Carl, where the gypsies were playing a plaintive, haunting waltz, to which people were dancing on the grass at the side. Von Eckenus were sitting at one of the little tables when Frau von Eckenu saw her, and she came quickly over, taking her arm. My Fräulein, we are so grieved. Marie has cried herself sick for grief. Tell us, how is das München, and if there is anything we can do? Thank you, said Madge. There is really nothing. Joey is much the same, and I have come to get my hair shampooed. The doctor sent me. Frau von Eckenu stared. To get your hair shampooed? she said. Yes, I have a note for Herr Braun. Then came this way, and we will find him. Doubtless he will be in the special cell. The good-natured Viennese led her way into the big dining room, where Herr Braun was engaged in directing and laying the table for dinner. When he saw them, he hurried forward, exclaiming, Madge gave him the doctor's note, and he read it through with wonderment in his eyes. Then he nodded his head wisely. It is well. If das Fräulein will come through here, it shall be done. He led her into the dressing room, and forty minutes later Madge was going back to the chalet, feeling refreshed and ready for anything. She peeped into Grisel's room, where good Frau Mensch sat knitting, one watchful eye on the kettle. Grisel was sleeping, propped up with pillow to relieve the breathing. She looked flushed. But there was nothing alarming. The illness would take its natural course, and the doctor was not alarmed about her. So much Frau Minch told the young-haired mistress, her busy fingers never ceasing their work. He will stay here for tonight, she continued in her low, murmurous voice that made the guttural German sound like soft music. I think he expects that little Jo will come to herself before the morning, mademoiselle, has come in, but she knows nothing about sick nursing and would be useless. Frau Marini will come tonight and watch by das München, for Fräulein Minard must sleep, and you will be with the little sister. Na, mein Liebling, as Madge tried to talk her, it is nothing. We are going to do what we can. You and she are very dear to us all, and we of the troll do not show ingratitude. See, Das München is waking. She opens her eyes. What is it, dear? said Madge. Do you want to know about Joey? She is still asleep. The doctor is staying here for a while. Well, will she be very ill? The words came slowly. She is very tired, said Madge, evasively, but she hasn't got bronchitis like you. Now you must rest, you naughty child. We want you to get well again as quickly as possible. The holidays are very near, you know. She bent to kiss the girl, and Grizel relaxed. I'm glad, she said. It wouldn't have been fair if Joey had to be ill for me. Madge left her after that and went back to the other sick room. The doctor looked at her keenly, but beyond a grunt, he said nothing. Throughout the long night, he sat there watching the little white face on the pillow, Madge watching with him. Once only, he left her to go and see Grizel and came back with the news that she was decidedly stronger. At ten o'clock, Frau Marini appeared, and Frau Mensch went to the hotel at Seaspitz. 
Five o'clock in the morning brought Miss Maynard to insist that Madge should lay down on the couch and rest for a couple of hours while she watched in her turn. At seven, the doctor went to ring up a partner in Innsbruck to warn him that he should stay where he was for that day. Later, Marie came with hot coffee, rolls, and butter, of which the doctor insisted Madge should partake, and at five to nine, she went downstairs to see to work for the day. The girls came with grave faces and kind messages and offer of help from their parents. The whole lakeside knew of poor Grizel's escapade, and a good many people had since learnt of the dreadful possible result for Joey, so there were many inquiries. Amy Stevens' first care was to grab Juliet and demand in an awestruck whisper, "'How is Joey? Has she come awake yet?' "'Not yet,' said Juliet, who looked white and heavy-eyed. "'Don't ask a madame any questions, Amy, will you? She's so dreadfully worried.' "'Of course I shan't,' returned Amy indignantly. "'I say it isn't the bell late.' There won't be any bell at all today, explained Juliet. Just go straight into prayer. Juliet, will you come here one minute, said Gisla. We want to know about Joey and Grizel, too. How are they both? Grizel is getting on fairly well, replied Juliet. Joey hasn't roused up yet. They can't say till she does what will happen. The doctors expect it will be today, and he is staying. He was here all last night, too. Prayers were very solemn that morning, and when they were over, there was a little stir among the girls. Madge looked at them. Joey is much the same, she said. There's no change yet. She left the actual schoolwork to Mademoiselle and Miss Maynard, flitting in and out at intervals. The weary day wore on, and still there was no news from the room at the top of the house. The girls behaved like angels, as Miss Maynard said afterwards. There could be no music lessons, of course, and Mademoiselle had rung up Herr Arncel to tell him. The one bright spot during the day was the fact that Grizel, reassured by their respective statements that Joey was asleep, and also by Madge's obvious forgiveness, was improving rapidly, temperature going down and breathing easier. At about three o'clock, as Madge was wearily trying to help Amy Stevens disentangle a glorious muddle of rivers and lakes in her map of Asia, word came down that the doctor would like to see her for a moment. She fled up the stairs to her bedroom. The doctor was standing by the bedside, one hand on Joey's wrist. He looked up at, his, at her sister as she entered. Ah, oh, mein Fräulein. I have sent for you, for I think she is beginning to arouse. Please stand just here, where she can see you. Madge took up the position he pointed out, and stood her eyes fixed on Joey's face. There was no doubt that she was coming out of the stupor. Her lashes flickered more than once, her lips were parted. The only question was, would she wake up? The old Joey, or would it be the babbling delirium of fever? There was a silence in the room that could be felt. The only sound to be heard was the breathing of four people. Frau Minch was by the window and the ticking of the doctor's watch. Then slowly, slowly, the long black lashes lifted and Joey looked full at her sister. Hello, she murmured. I'm awfully tired. Hiya. She finished with a little yawn turned slightly, snuggled down into the pillow, and fell asleep. Gott sie dank, said the doctor quietly. She will do now. There is no further danger. Hush, mein Kind, for Madge had begun to cry. It is well now. I know, sobbed Madge, but, oh, Herr Doctor, the relief. He sighed to Frau Minch, who led her down to the study and let her cry away the last of the awful weight that had been hanging over her. When finally the tears were all dried, she found a dainty meal of soup, rolls, and grapes awaiting her, and when she had finished, Frau Minch suggested bed. I must tell the girls first, said Madge. I will make myself tidy and go and tell them. 
Ten minutes later, Miss Bettany, who looked like herself once more, entered the room where they were all anxiously awaiting her news. She looked at them, but no words would come to her lips. It was Bernhilda the Quiet who helped her out. Ah, oh, madame, she said, there is no need to say anything. Joey will get well. Madge found her voice. Yes, she said. She's sleeping now, and all is safe once more. And there were rejoicing in the chalet school that afternoon. Chapter 25 Frau Berlin again. Oh, I say, isn't this perfectly galoptious? Joey, what an appalling expression. Where on earth did you get it? What, galoptious? I heard those schoolboys who ran into at the Tarnzi use it. Well, I wish you wouldn't. It's all very well for schoolboys, but it isn't pretty for schoolgirls. So cut it out. Joey cocked her black head out on one side consideringly. Getting a bit old maidish, aren't you, old thing, she said. Don't do it, Madgy. Joey, you little brute. I won't be called such awful names. And you might show a little more respect for your headmistress. You get worse and worse every day. Poor old darling, never mind. Wait till we get back to the school again, and then you can be crushing as you like. This is a holiday time, and there's no one to hear us for once. I think it was topping of the Marinis to take Grisel and Juliet away for the week and let us be on our own for a bit. And this really is a gorgeous place. I never imagined anything like it. Madge nodded as she glanced up at the great peaks of the Rosengarten Geberge, which towered above them. Their own limestone crags in the North Troll was magnificent, but they were not to be compared with these. As far as they could see, lofty pinnacles of rose-hued rock lifted magnificent heads to the summer sky. Every here and there, cataracts flung themselves downwards into the silver ribbons, which leapt from rock to rock, all hurrying to join the river which dashed past, making thunderous music as it went, for the two previous days had been very wet, and all the springs and mountain streams were flooded. Neither Madge nor Joe had been in the South Troll before, though both knew the North Troll very well, and when Frau Marini had come with a suggestion that Grisel and Juliet should go to Vienna with them for a week while the two sisters had a little holiday to themselves, it had been Joey's idea that they should come here. We can't go too far, she argued. For one thing, we can't afford it. We've never seen Marin or Bortzen or Primero or any of those other places, and the Manches say the Dolmites are just gorgeous. It's warm there, so it suits us both, and it's been rather chilly here lately. So let's go there, shall us? Madge had laughed and agreed. There was nothing to keep them at the Tarn Z. Miss Maynard was spending the holiday with her family in the high Alps, and Mademoiselle had gone home to her beloved Paris, taking Simone and the two little Stevens with her. The Marini's kind invitation had settled Juliet and Grisel, and so seven days previously the two Bettanies had left Innsbruck en route to Bozen by way of the magnificent Kutterswag gorge. Bodson they had loved, and Marin was a dream of delight, and they had left the little Roman town only that morning to establish themselves in the tiny village of Panerimo, in the Rosengarten Valley, and here on the morrow the other two girls would join them. Joey now turned and slipped on arm through her sisters. It's been jolly on our own, Madge nodded, but said, I told them at the chalet to forward letters here. You might run and see if we have any. F I forgot to ask. right -o, said Joey, as she dashed off to return in a very few minutes, waving a whole budget. Here you are, dozens of them, and least there are ten, eight for you and two for me. This is from Simone, and it looks like Marie von Eckenew Madge. You aren't paying any attention. 
What on earth's the matter? Who's your letter from? Is there anything wrong? What is it? Madge pulled herself together with an effort and turned to her sister. It's rather dreadful news in one way, Joey. There's been a terrible motor accident in Rome, and Captain and Mrs. Carrick were in it. Joey looked serious. Are they awfully hurt? Mrs. Carrick was killed at once, said Madge, and Captain Carrick died two days ago. He has left me Juliet to bring up, as they have no relations. Madge gathered up her letters and went to her bedroom. Joey sat, looking after her. She was silent for a minute, and then she turned to her own letters. Let's see what Simone's got to say. Meanwhile, Madge Bettany sat in her bedroom, reading the letter written by a doctor of the hospital where Captain Carrick had died. After describing generally his injuries, the writer had continued. Captain Carrick told me that his daughter was with you and that you would be her guardian. He made a will before he died, leaving all he possessed, including some very valuable jewelry belonging to his wife and a sum of 100,000 lire, in trust to you for the girl. He asked me to say he hoped that you would forgive the trick he played on you and would undertake the trust. The money I gathered, he had won at the tables at Monte Carlo. He died three hours after he had made the will. The letter concluded with a request to know how the jewels and money were to be sent and a suggestion that Madge should come to Rome to fetch them, when my wife will be delighted to welcome you to our home as our guest. When she had finished rereading this startling communication, Madge sat, thinking hard. In one way, the event settled the Juliet difficulty, but by no means completely solved it. Pondering over the problem seemed to bring her no nearer its solution. So she shelved the matter for the moment and turned her attention to her other letters. One was from Mrs. Denet, who had written to make final arrangements for Rosalie, who was coming to the chalet school next term. Another came from Mrs. Stevens, thanking her for the care of Margia and Amy and enclosing a very welcoming check for the next term's fees. The third she took up was on very expensive paper in a most illiterate hand and bore the postmark of Bradford, which puzzled her extremely. Bradford, she said aloud, who on earth do I know in Bradford? Open the letter, old thing, then you'll find out, observed Joey's voice from the doorway. Madge literally jumped. Joey happened to be wearing plimsolls, and her steps had been quite noiseless. Sorry, she observed, as she dropped down beside her sister. I didn't mean to startle you. I am finished my letter, so I thought I'd come back to see what you're doing. I say, if Captain Carrick has left Juliet to you, how does he imagine you're going to manage for money? There's money for her, returned Madge. You needn't worry, Joey. But... I'm rather afraid. We shall have to go back to the Tarnsey tomorrow. They want me to go to Rome to see about Juliet's affairs. And who is your Bradford pal? asked Joey. Madge opened the letter and glanced at the beginning. Honored and respected madam. Good heavens, who on earth can it be? She turned to the end, but found no enlightenment there. The signature finished off with a flourish was James H. Kettlewell. James H. Kettlewell? Never heard of him, began Joey. No, and yet it's vaguely familiar. Madge thought hard for a minute. Joey, I've got it. Do you remember the man in Paris, train, who gave us the gooseberries? His name was Kettlewell, and he told us he lived in Bradford. Oh, so he did. Whatever can be right, whatever can he be writing about? Buck up and see. Uh-huh. Honored and respected madam, began Madge, I take my pen in hand to inscribe this present epistle to you. Coo, what an elegant English, commented Joey. Be quiet. If you interrupt, I won't read it at all. Sorry. I'll be good. Do go on. I'm dying to know what he's about. Where was I? Oh, yes. It is with the greatest diffidence that I venture to approach you on such a subject, knowing, as I do, the delicacy with which 
it should be treated, especially to a high up lady like you. What on earth? Is the man mad? Oh, get on, implored Joey impatiently. Don't be so aggravating. All right. It's my letter, remember. Let's see. Lady like you, believe me, honored madam, I should not have the, uh, uh, the temerity to approach you thus were it not that I feel. Her voice died away as her eyes wandered down the page. Then she suddenly sat bolt upright in horror. Joey, it's a very private letter. I suppose you meant it's a proposal, Joey interrupted her. Oh, I knew what was coming after the very first sentence. Oh, I say. She went off into fits of laughter. Madge shook her slightly. Joey, behave yourself. It's not a thing to laugh at. If I'd known, I'd never have read it to you. I thought it was just an ordinary letter. You must give me your word of honor never to mention it to a soul. What do you take me for? Joey was righteously indignant. Of course I shan't. Oh, dear, this is dreadful. Madge had turned over the page and was reading on. But of all the weird things to happen, Joey got up and strolled over to the, to the window. I scarcely ever thought of him again, and he was awfully sweet and kind, of course, but I must say it seems a mad thing to do when he'd only seen you once. Why, he couldn't know if you were good-tempered or decent housekeeper or, or truthful or anything. Oh, Joey, be quiet, exclaimed the exasperated Madge. You talk the hind leg off a donkey. Oh, dear, why does everything come at once? It's rotten luck, old thing. Joey's teasing mood had suddenly vanished. You have had a time of it since we came to Austria. Let's hope next term is quieter than this has been. One thing, Grizel can't go off climbing mountains. Madge got up, folding her letter and putting it back into its envelope. Joey, I don't want you to think I'm always saying don't, but I'd rather not talk about this affair just yet. It's too soon after. She cast a thought to those dreadful hours when it had been doubtful what was going to happen to the speaker and suddenly hugged her. It was all very horrible. We won't talk about it at all, Joey. Let's see. What's the other letters? There was nothing exciting in them. Two of them were from the aunts in England, one from an old school friend of Madge's, and the last asked for a prospectus of the school. Later they strolled along by the banks of the rushing stream. It had been a weird affair all round, said Jo, as she stood throwing in pebbles trying to make them skim the surface of the water. What has, demanded her sister, why all this? Coming to Austria and having the school and Juliet and James H. Kettlewell's letter and everything. Yes, but I don't see why you call it weird affair. Madge was deeply interested. Joe's imagination often helped to throw new light on matters, and she wondered what new light was going to be thrown on the chalet school. Why, it's this way. We came out to the Tarnsey because we're frantically poor. You decided to start a school, and it goes like like fun. We do heaps of things in one term, and we grow from three to eighteen. Then, when the school is just going like everything, you get a chance to chuck it if you want to and get married. We're jolly lucky, I think. Madge nodded. Yes, that's quite true, but, oh, if we're going to have the same sort of excitements each term that we've had this, I shan't want to give it up. Still, they haven't been bad excitements, except the last. Not really bad, Madge. Did you ever? There's Frau Berlin. Frau Berlin where? Joey, don't point. It's frightfully rude. There, by the house. Well, I'll be gum -swiggled. Joey. Well, but did you ever? Golly, she's coming along. It's glory. Wonder if she knows me. But she passed them without a look while Joey gazed at her with wide open eyes. She'll recognize Grizel, she said. When the tartan-clad lady had finally waddled out of her hearing, old Madge, if she does. I'm not going to risk any more fusses, said Madge with determination. If there's the slightest chance of that, back we go tomorrow. 
Perhaps it would be best. I say I'm awfully hungry. Let's go back and see if we can get anything to eat. I must be, it must be nearly lunchtime. As Madge was hungry too, she agreed, and presently they were enjoying a substantial meal. Just as they reached the dessert stage, the door opened, and in rolled Frau Berlin. That settles it, murmured Miss Bettany. You may pack up tonight, for as soon as Grizel and Juliet arrive, we go back to the Tarnsey. I think I must go to Rome after all. So that will be all right. It will just fit in nicely. As soon as they could, they left the spisal and returned to their room. That's the finish, said Jo, as she finally rolled into bed at about half past nine. There can't be anything more after this. However, the morrow was to bring them just one more surprise. Chapter 26 A Grand Wind Up. What do you think? An old pal of yours is here, Grizel, a very dear friend. Grizel, thus greeted by a wildly excited Joey on her arrival at Panarimo, looked at her suspiciously. Who on earth is it? Guess. Can't, can't think of a soul likely to be in Austria. Who is it, Joey? Think, Griselda. Think of someone you met a short while ago. But I haven't met anyone except people you have to. Why, is it a pal of mine? Someone you had a fearful row with, Joey prompted, her jumping tensingly up and down. I can't think. Joey, you don't mean Frau Berlin. Oh, it is. It is. Well done, you. Yes, it is. Well, what do you think of it? My dear, it's awful. Has she seen you yet? Does she know? Do you think? Joey shook her head. Don't think so. Anyway, we're not staying. Madge won't risk it. What do you mean by not staying? Where are we going? Home. Oh, you don't know yet, of course. Joey cast a weary eye at Madge and Juliet, who were walking ahead. Come on down to the river. We aren't going till the afternoon train, and we're to spend the night at Innsbruck. It's rather awful in some ways, but on the whole, I think it might be worse. My sister had a letter from Rome yesterday, and Juliet's father and mother are dead. Grizel gra gasped. Joey! Oh, how dreadful! Poor Juliet! What will she do? Her father asked Madge to look after her, and he's left her some money to do with, said Joey. That's one reason why we're going home. Madge has to go to Rome to get it. We're going back to the Brassau, and Miss Maynard is coming to look after us. She was coming anyhow, so that's all right. What sort of time do you have in what sort of time did you have in Vienna? Top hole, said Grizel, plunged straightway into the account of her adventure. When finally they turned their steps towards the hotel, they saw Madge coming to meet them. She was by herself and was walking rather slowly. Have you told Juliet? said Joey in hushed tones as she reached them. Yes, I want you two to be very kind to Juliet. She's been through a good deal lately, and naturally she is very much upset. I needn't tell you not to hang round her or do anything silly like that, but just be as nice as you can to her. We are going back to Innsbruck this afternoon, and then tomorrow we shall go up to the Tarnsee, and I shall have to leave you there, as I must go to Rome to settle up affairs for her. Miss Maynard will be with you, and I want you to give her a little trouble as possible. I'm sorry I can't send for her to come here, but under the circumstances, I'm afraid it's rather impossible. Grizel colored furiously, although her headmistress had not attempted to make the last remark especially pointed. She knew well enough, however, that her behavior at the outpost was mainly the cause of their leaving Panorimo that afternoon. She said nothing, but followed Joey into the hotel with unaccustomed meekness. Madge herself had said nothing about what had occurred on that Saturday, when Grizel had followed her own willful way and tried to climb the turnjock. But Frau Marini had had no scruple, and she had told the girl very plainly of what they had heard for Joey during the two long days which had followed. Rosel had had a dreadful shock, and she was never again so thoughtless. "'Where is Juliet?' asked Joey, as they reached the foot of the stairs. "'Upstairs in her room,' replied Madge. "'Yes, go to yours, too. 
Take them both out and show them the place, Joey. There are one or two odds and ends of packing I must finish up, and I'd rather not risk a fuss with that Frau Berlin, as you call her. So keep out of the way till luncheon. Our train goes at three, so you won't have much time here. Make the most of it. Upstairs in the big, airy room, with its twin beds, and they found Juliet standing at the window, staring listlessly out at the mountains. She was not crying, as Joey had half feared, but she had a white, worn look, as though she had been ill, and her eyes were heavy and weary. "'Come on, see the mountains, old Jew,' said Joey, slipping her hand into the elder girl's. "'They're topping, though. Not a bit like ours at home, of course.' "'Yes, do come,' urged Grizel. "'And, oh, Juliet, that awful woman's here.' "'Which one?' asked Juliet, though with a complete lack of interest in her voice. "'Fra Berlin, the one who had such was such a pig the day we went to Innsbruck "'and to get Madame's birthday gift. Don't you remember?' "'Oh, yes, I remember. "'All right, Joey, I'll come.' "'But... Though she let them pull her downstairs and out into the sunshine, it seemed as though she didn't really care much what she did. The shock of hearing what Madge had told her, even though the news had been broken to her with great tenderness, had dazed her for the time being. Through all the chatter of the other two, she was conscious of just one thought. If only I could have felt they loved me. However, the fresh air and sunshine did her good, and when finally Miss Bettany came to summon them to lunch, she looked better than she had done. No countertemps occurred with Frau Berlin, for she did not appear. Nevertheless, Madge felt very thankful when she found herself safely in Innsbruck train without having had a scene. Juliet settled herself in a corner with a book, but she did not appear to read much. Most of the time she was gazing unseeingly out of the window. The other two had retired to the far end of the compartment, which they had to themselves, and at Joey's bright suggestion embarked on a game of roadside cribbage. As they were thinking of these things, she suddenly came aware that the train was slackening speed, and even as she looked up to see where they were, it began to rock violently backwards and forwards with a sickening motion. She had barely time to leap to her feet before, with a mighty crash, the carriage gave a final lurch and collapsed on its side. Above the noise she heard the screams of the three girls mingling with shrieks from the other passengers. Mercilessly, Joey had flung herself on the floor, dragging Grizel with her by a positive miracle. Neither Madge nor Juliet had been badly hurt though the former was, like everyone else, slightly stunned, and Juliet, as they found out after, was badly bruised. Also, being thoroughly English, they had had the window wide open and had a means of an exit. The door, when Miss Bettany tried it, was jammed. "'It's a good thing none of us are fat,' she said, with a shaky laugh. "'Come along, you three. I'm going to push you through the window. Grizel first. Grizel had the sense— to make no protest, besides, she was still rather dazed, so she allowed her headmistress to push and tug till she was through, and then, as the fresh air began to clear her stupefied brain, she reached down and helped to pull Juliet up. Joey was an easy matter, and she was soon standing in a heap of stones, looking very white and scared, while the two big girls dragged her sister out. They had just pulled her clear, when from the front of the train came the dreadful cry of fire. Phew, phew, shrieked a fat woman who was badly jammed in the window frame of the next compartment. Madge flung a hasty, stay where you are, don't you dare move, at the terrified girls and dashed to the rescue. The scene was becoming ghastly. The big engine and three of the long carriages lay on their side in a narrow gorge like... The foremost carriage was already wrapped in flames, and their roaring rose above the screams and cries of the people still imprisoned in the other carriages. The three remaining 
on their wheels had disgorged all their passengers and already men were tearing along, working madly to save those in such deadly peril. Madge Betney contrived to take in all these things as she made that frantic scramble onto the side of the carriage where a terrified fat woman with gray hair streaming widely round her was struggling madly to get free of the window frame. She pulled her hands and pulled and pulled. Keep still a moment. Now, ready? Then she hurt. Sh then, as hard as you can. There was a struggle and a sound of rending and tearing and sudden gasp. And then the other woman suddenly shot out of, over the wheels and on to the heap of stones, her clothes in shreds, but otherwise safe. Madge sprang down beside her, and then she felt the world turning black, and she fainted. When she came to herself, she was lying on a cot in a field. Joey was kneeling beside her, crying vehemently, and a big fair man, whom she did not know, was holding something to her lips. With an effort, she pulled herself together and pushed it away. No, no, she said. Oh, Madge, sobbed Joey. Oh, I thought you, I thought you were dead. Hush, said the man. She'll be all right in a minute. It's only whiskey and water I'm giving you, madam. Better take it. It'll buck you up. No, I'm all right. With an effort, she sat up, pushing the hair off her face. Joey promptly flung her arms around her, hugging her tightly. Juliet and Grizel seemed to have vanished. Oh, Madge, darling. Oh, I had such a fright. Oh, Madge. There, that'll do, said their benefactor. You're not helping her, kid. Let her alone for a minute or two to come round. It's quite all right. The other kids are safe enough. And, oh, you plucky girl, it was one of the bravest things I've ever seen. It was nothing, returned Madge, who was rapidly coming to herself. Joey, don't strangle me, child. Let me get up. She contrived to get into her feet, but was glad enough of the arm the stranger flung round her as she was swaying for a moment. There, he said rather roughly, come over here and sit down a minute. You can't do everything at once. I'll send the other kids along. And you'll be all right in a minute. No, there's nothing you can do. Everyone got clear but the driver. He fell in his head, poor chap. Even the fat lady you rescued is fine. Yes, and oh, Madge, who do you think it is? Interrupted Joey with considerable lack of both manners and grammar. It's Frau Berlin. Oh, goodness, said Madge, beginning to laugh weakly. Isn't it rum? And we left Penarimo because of her and Grizel. And then you save her life. Yes, you did. The carriage got on fire just as you slithered down. If it hadn't been for you, she'd have burnt to death. She was only bumped a bit, and she wanted to kiss you. Only that man came and hiked you off into the field, and she suddenly found all of her torn clothing and got mad. Grizel and Juliet are over there. They aren't hurt, nor am I. Do buck up, Madge. Thus Joey, in a breathless, hurrying tumult of words, that man stood on the other side, smiling at the elder girl, managed to take it all in. Then Grizel and Juliet appeared at all the excitement began over again. At length he interfered. Now then, you kids, let's go and see what we can do about getting on. I know this place, and we're about ten miles from anywhere besides Miss Bettany, supplied Madge. There are, are my sister, Joey, and two of her pupils, Roselle Cochran and Juliet Carrick. Ah, thank you, he replied. My name's Russell, James Russell, at your service. Well, as I was going to say, Miss Bettany, you had better get somewhere where you can lay down for a bit. There's a main road goes past here somewhere, and with luck, we ought to get a lift in something. If you will take my arm... I think we can get there all right, and we can't do anything here. There was common sense in what he said, so they set off, Madge beginning to realize how very shaky she had felt. The girls were upset, too, and it took them some time to make the road. Luckily, just as they reached it, a peasant came past with an empty hay cart, and Mr. Russell quickly came to an arrangement with him. A couple of hours later, they were safely at Guslas of a tiny village. They stayed there all night, and their new friend going on to Innsbruck after leaving his card, and Joey, 
and getting the chalet address so that he could write to Miss Maynard, not to expect them for another day. The morning found them all very tired and worn out, but Madge wanted to get back to the Tarnsey and home, so they set off and finally arrived at the chalet, where they were rapturously welcomed by an anxious Miss Maynard, who had been feeling very worried. Mr. James Russell had been better than his word, for he had gone up to the Tarnsey and given her a full description of what had occurred. "'I'm thankful you've all arrived safely,' said the young mathematics mistress. "'I couldn't feel so sure you wouldn't have another awful adventure. "'I think I'd rather keep out of adventures for some time to come,' laughed Madge, rather shakily. "'Teaching in school generally will be enough for me for the next three or four years, I can assure you.' "'Oh, I expect we'll have some more adventures presently,' said Joey. "'And so they did.' But that, as Mr. Kipling says, is another story. The End mm -hmm.